All right, we have multiple pressing stories to get to. Stories that include a midnight coup taking place in the U.S. Senate. Something I've been trying to point out on X for the last few days because it's happening. The establishment wing of the Republican Party, what's left of it, the rhinos are trying to make an end run around President Trump's mandate. This is a super important story that will have ramifications for the next two to four years. Also, we have Tucker Carlson weighing in, RFK Jr., hopefully getting word to the president or at least his inner circle. And it's not stopping at the Senate, people. Establishment Washington are up in arms over Trump's sweeping victory. You can see it now. It's clear as day. They are coming for his transition team, trying to worm their way in to Trump's good graces. We have the details and more stories from around the country. But before we get started, thank you for liking and sharing these videos. It really helps out the channel. And consider subscribing so you don't miss these regular updates. So what the hell is happening in the U.S. Senate, an institution that the American people just re-elected Republicans to, gave the Republican Party a significant majority because of Donald Trump. Because we are sick of the establishment class, the pro-war caucus lining their own pockets instead of doing what's best for America. Well, they're at it again. Last night, Mitch McConnell announced a surprise snap vote for Senate Majority Leader. Who will be the new Senate Majority Leader? And he put up three choices, all of which are bad, two of which are absolutely terrible. And for the record, Mitch McConnell despises Donald Trump. He was the chief proponent in the Senate, working in the background to curtail Trump during his first term. In the last few weeks of Trump's presidency, it was Mitch McConnell who stopped him from pardoning Julian Assange and Edward Snowden. Mitch McConnell, along with Mike Pompeo and others, who stopped that from happening. At the time, Trump was going through his second impeachment inquiry, and Mitch McConnell reportedly told Donald Trump, if you pardon either of them, I can promise you won't be acquitted in the Senate. Now, he did this two times to Trump. Twice, Trump wanted to pardon Assange and Edward Snowden, and both times Mitch McConnell and Mike Pompeo worked to undermine that effort. Watch. So in last night's show and on previous shows, we've told you about the cases of two men, Julian Assange and John Karakou. Julian Assange is a kind of international journalist. John Karakou is a former CIA officer. We should be totally blunt and tell you we're not sure we show the politics of either man. But both of their cases tell you something really important about what's going on in this country, about what matters, and about what the people in charge would like to prevent you from doing. Julian Assange and John Karakou both went to jail for telling the truth. Neither one stole classified documents from the U.S. government. Neither one of them hacked into anything. In both cases, those men went to prison. And in both cases tonight, as one of his final acts as president, Donald Trump has the opportunity to make that right, to pardon both of them. We told you that last night. We told you it before. We're hearing tonight that neither man, particularly Julian Assange, we don't know if this is true, is likely to get a pardon. Why? Well, apparently, because Republicans in the Senate, and by Republicans in the Senate, we mean Mitch McConnell of Kentucky, the leader of Republicans in the Senate, has sent word over to the White House, if you pardon Julian Assange, we are much more likely to convict you in an impeachment trial. Now, is it legal to hold that over a president's head? We're not lawyers, we don't know. It's certainly wrong. But more than that, it tells you everything about their priorities. Now, I first learned about this snap election yesterday from Senator Mike Lee, who, by the way, Mike Lee, he's a great U.S. senator, a great Republican senator. He posted this survey on X. Who would you like to see as the next Senate Republican leader? Right now, Mitch McConnell is securing votes as we speak for John Thune, which would, which would be a terrible setback, a massive setback to Trump. John Thune is Mitch McConnell's number two. He's basically mini Mitch McConnell. He hates Trump. Is President-elect uh, Trump involved in, in, does he have a chosen um, preference in, in the Senate? Do you, do you know, Senator? And, and will that come into play? I don't. 
Well, I don't know that he does. I, I, I stay in regular uh, contact uh, with him and with his team. And, um, you know, obviously, if he wants to, he could uh, exert a considerable amount of influence on that. But uh, honestly, I think my preference would be, and I think it's probably in his best interest, to stay out of that. These uh, Senate uh, secret ballot elections are probably best left to senators, and, and he's got to work with all of us when it's all said and done. He is the opposite of MAGA, supports the Ukraine war full stop. John Cornyn, the second option, just as bad. He was one of the chief proponents of the Democrats' border bill that Kamala Harris wouldn't stop talking about on the campaign trail. He not only endorsed it, he helped write it. Rick Scott, the third option, he's the only one out of these three choices who actually liked Donald Trump. Now, Good news, we have some good news. Last night, thank the Lord, Tucker Carlson got involved writing this on X. What the hell is going on in the U.S. Senate? Hours after Trump wins the most conclusive mandate in 40 years, McConnell engineers a coup against his agenda by calling early leadership elections in the Senate. Two of the three candidates hate Trump and what he ran on. One of them, John Cornyn, is an angry liberal whose politics are indistinguishable from Liz Cheney's. The election is Wednesday. It's by secret ballot, and it will determine whether or not the new administration succeeds. Rick Scott of Florida is the only candidate who agrees with Donald Trump. Call your senator and demand a public endorsement of Rick Scott. Don't let McConnell get away with this again. RFK Jr. piping in as well, writing this, without Rick Scott, the entire Trump reform agenda begins to get wobbly. Isn't it amazing how McConnell's making this a secret ballot? So you can't see what your senator or who your senator is voting for. It's unbelievable. Now, I feel much better now that Tucker said something. You know it's going to at least reach the president's inner circle. After Tucker posted this, you saw Don Jr., a ton of other senators pick up on the fact that Rick Scott is the popular candidate. Basically, pick Rick Scott is going viral right now. Let's hope the Senate Republicans listen. And this fight doesn't stop with the Senate, folks. The next few weeks are going to be critical, absolutely critical in determining if Trump will be successful over the next two to four years. Transitions are chaotic. The president-elect needs to hire thousands beyond thousands of people. He's conducting interviews all day long for different positions. And you're already seeing the swamp creatures burrowing themselves into the fold. It's crazy how this machine works. Each time I see this, I try to point it out on X. For example, the worst possible pick for Secretary of Defense somehow, don't ask me how, managed to get an interview yesterday with Donald Trump. Watch this. Mike Rogers of Alabama is being considered for Secretary of Defense. Chanley Painter joins us live in studio with more. Chanley. Hey, good morning, Will Pete and Rachel. So President-elect Trump's transition team already betting potential candidates to fill his cabinet come January. A source to Fox Digital confirming that Congressman Mike Rogers, a Republican from Alabama who serves as chairman of the Armed Forces, or, excuse me, Armed Services Committee, has been contacted by Trump's team for the Secretary of Defense position. And other potential candidates include Florida Representative Mike Walls and former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Now, why is Mike Rogers so awful? Well, let me try to break this down quickly. I'll do it real fast. There's this hierarchy in Congress, okay? A lot of people assume all congressmen are created equal, that all 535 members are more or less the same. It's not true. There's a hierarchy. You have the Senate Majority Leader, the Senate Minority Leader, the Speaker of the House, then the Minority Leader in the House, then you have the chairmans of each of the committees. That makes up a few dozen congressmen who have elevated access and clearance, and they make the rules. Then you have the eight people who sit on top. You have the Gang of Eight. And you wouldn't think so, but those eight members of Congress have significant power in the U.S. government. They have the highest of clearance levels, they're legally allowed to be read into all special access programs and even TSSCI clearance level programs for oversight purposes. They can do that on request. No one else in Congress has anywhere near that kind of access. They can know just about anything that they want, again, on request. And Mike Rogers is one of them because he's the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, a very powerful committee chair. That chairman seat's that chairman's seat puts him in that 
eight-member club, the Gang of Eight. And you won't see Marjorie Taylor Greene or Lauren Boebert or any of those MAGA people being given that chairman job. None of those eight members are MAGA loyal. But Mike Rogers, Mike Turner are both the worst of the worst. They are bought and paid for by the military industrial complex. You can look up Mike Rogers donors, his top donors, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, all big aerospace companies. He was one of the principal members who killed the UFO Disclosure Act last year. Now, watch this next clip and tell me what would happen if Trump were to put someone like Mike Rogers, who's bought and paid for by the military industrial complex, in the Secretary of Defense seat. Roll the tape. On discussions at the Pentagon, I, mean, I don't know at what level this is. It just seems like it's informal discussions. I guess it's understandable they would have those discussions. It also, uh, Scott, I mean, Scott, is it? Look, I, I don't like this because what's Donald Trump supposed to think? You know, he's sitting down there, he's a the president-elect, and now he's got to read the newspaper tonight that the unelected bureaucracy of the federal government is having meetings at some level about how to thwart or countermand the commander-in-chief. I don't care if it's at the Pentagon or at the HUD or Ag Department. It doesn't matter. The unelected bureaucracy of this government answers to the civilian and duly elected leadership that we just did. And, and, and what, if you were in his shoes and you just won the popular vote with a clear mandate and, and, and now you've got to read that these unelected bureaucrats are plotting against you, what would you think? If they, think problems, if, they that, have, finish. if they have problems, they should not have meetings that then leak to the press. If they have ideas or things, they should call the president's office and say, hey, we'd like to have some discussions for planning purposes. But secret meetings that leak? Terrible way to get off to a start with the new administration. Well, I agree that that's maybe not the best way to do it. However, Trump has set them up to be in this situation where they think that he's coming after them. He has to buck the system here and nominate someone like Tulsi Gabbard as Secretary of Defense. That's just my opinion. And luckily, online, MAGA has been making their voices heard on this issue, trying to, trying to point out the people who should not get anywhere near Donald Trump's administration. And it looks like it's working. Last night, got some good news. Donald Trump posted this. I will not be inviting Nikki Haley or Mike Pompeo Good riddance to join the Trump administration, which is currently in formation. I very much enjoyed and appreciated working with them previously and would like to thank them for their service. MAGA, make America great again. Booyah. Now that's a great start, but there are so many of these swamp monsters, it's hard to even tell them apart. Realize the House has largely been purged of these establishment type Republicans, but the Senate, the Senate's still filled with them. In another story, Wall Street is celebrating this Trump victory with the Dow rallying over 1,400 points almost on Wednesday after, after it was clear that Trump would be the 47th president. But not everyone celebrating Trump's victory. In the finance space, for instance, chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, he is angry as hell. Some of the president's elect's advisors have suggested that you should resign. Um, if he asked you to leave, would you go? No. Uh, can you follow up on, is, is, do you think that legally he did, you're not required to leave? No. Do you believe the president has the power to fire or demote you and has the Fed determined the legality of a president demoting at will any of the other governors with leadership positions? Not permitted under the law. All right, that wraps up the news part of today's video. Now I'm going to tell you about today's sponsor, which ties directly into what we were just talking about and quite possibly, quite possibly the cheapest gold exposure that we can get our hands on as of today, anywhere in the world as far as I'm aware. The company is called Gold Mining Inc., trading on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol GLDG. You can see it on your screen. They are the sponsor of today's video, Gold Mining Inc., right now trading for 86 cents a share which is near its five-year low. This is a very important part of the reason that I'm even showcasing this right now. Think about it. Spot gold trading at an all-time high. Gold stock ETFs like the GDXJ and the GDXU trading near 52-week highs, yet gold mining inks still near its five-year low. And I've said this before. I don't think there's ever been a better moment to build a position in gold companies than in November 2024. It's indisputable. The gold spot price... Currently, $26.98 an ounce as I record this, over 40% above the 2011 all-time high, yet the GDXJ index is down 
compared with its peak from 2011. How is that even how is that even possible? And as you know, Bank of America is predicting gold could hit $3,000 an ounce by the end of 2025. Meanwhile, Gold Mining Inc. is trading near its five-year lows. So let's talk about Gold Mining Inc.'s near-term catalyst. The company, they own 80% of an Alaskan gold exploration and development company, U.S. Gold Mining Inc. It's a position that's currently worth around 80 million U.S. The company's in the middle of a drill program right now, folks. And you know what happens when companies announce drilling results, right? The company owns a $30 million position USD in Gold Royalty Corp based on its closing price. This is one of the fastest growing royalty companies in the natural resource sector. Gold Mining Inc. also owns 75% of a uranium project that gets almost zero attention. Even though the founder of the company and its present co-chairman is Mr. Amir Adani, the founder of Uranium Energy Corp. I'm sure you've heard about that multi-billion dollar uranium company. Think about that for a second. The project, located in the Athabasca Basin in Alberta, Canada, one of the best uranium areas around the globe, and it's co-owned with French uranium giant Orano. Now, here's a snapshot of Gold Mining Inc.'s value proposition. I want to showcase this quickly, less than a minute, if you'll let me, so you see why I'm so bullish on this company. GLDG market cap, $175 million right now. That's what the entire company costs presently publicly on the market. Current market value of their ownership stake of USGO, $95 million. Current market value stake of their ownership in GROY, $35 million. Bringing the enterprise value, ready for this, $175 million minus $95 million minus $35 million equals a $55 million enterprise value. Like what? When the company originally acquired their dozen gold projects, the peak combined market caps of those companies that held them was approximately 850 million Canadian. So the peak market cap of companies acquired was 850 million in 2010 to 2012, yet the current market cap of gold mining inks only $175 million in 2024. And the gold spot price, by the way, 1925 and 2011, yet today $2,700 an ounce in 2024. To me, this is a strong value proposition. All right, so what are we looking at here? Gold Mining Inc. owns a total of 11 projects containing an estimated 12.5 million ounces of gold equivalent resources in the measured and indicated category and an additional estimated 9.7 million ounces of gold equivalent resource in the inferred category. That's with a market cap currently at 175 million and approximately 120 mil in publicly traded stock in its coffers based on current market values. Again, Gold Mining Inc. I find to be one of one hell of a value play on the New York Stock Exchange. Obviously, always do your own due diligence. I'm only providing some of the information about the company and the segment. All right, that wraps up this episode. Like, subscribe. We'll see you next time.